<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics Experts. I'm here with uh, Brett Lavette. How you doing, Brett? I'm doing good, Nick. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so you are with the Institute of Conflict Management. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what your work is uh, there and how you kind of got into this game? Okay, so the Institute for Conflict Management uh, was started by Natalie Armstrong uh, Motan, and she's still an uh, active uh, partner of mine, uh, colleague. Uh, she started it about 15, 15, between 15, 17 years ago. And at that time, it was really uh, a time in the world where she was traveling around the, uh, around the earth and uh, delivering uh, programs, seminars, things of that nature in different countries. Uh, on conflict management uh, and dispute resolution, things of that nature. I came aboard mm, uh, five, six years ago, and we uh, developed more into a uh, professional development uh, organization. Um, I came with a background in dispute resolution. I um, also have a pretty uh, lengthy background in sexual harassment and bullying prevention. Oh, cool. And teaching those programs uh, and, and soft skills. That was kind of uh, my thing. So we, we merged those two. Um, I just basically brought that material in, in uh, made uh, the Institute for Conflict, Conflict Management a little bit more robust on the professional development side. So do we do casework? Not really, unless we have a friend that calls and says, hey, I need you to you know, look at doing this. Um, right. Now, uh, Ms. Armstrong handles the marketing primarily for the Institute for Conflict Management and for others in the legal industry. And I handle the professional development and learning and development side of the Institute of Conflict Management. So what, what are the different sort of um, like lanes that you'll get involved in? So you'll get involved on one side and she'll get involved on the other side. Or what, are the, what are the areas that you're trying to kind of attack? Um, and improve? Is one sort of more preventative and one is more sort of reactionary or how would you, how do you look at the impact that you end up having on an organization potentially? That's a good question. You know, we're a small operation by, by comparison because there's just the two of us, um, although we have resources outside of us that we'll, you know, tap into if we need to, such as when we develop online content um, pre-recorded online content. So we, we have some pre-recorded online content um, in sexual harassment prevention in conflict management uh, certification program. And then we have, and then we offer live virtual trainings. So we'll take the same programs and we'll do it live virtual to a group. Um, obviously before COVID-19, uh, we were able to do these things in person. Uh, generally we would go into a corporation um, and whatever their, you know, after an assessment and assessing what those needs potentially were, recommending those needs, if they wanted us to deliver a training, yeah. we would do that. So Natalie specifically handled the communication side of, you know, this is what we're going to do and this is what it's going to look like. And then Brett would go in and yeah. actually deliver uh, the content. So what kind of tripwire would an organization hit to say, I got to reach out to the Institute of Conflict Management? Like what are, <laughs> you talked about a, uh, kind of an assessment that that could be sort of either self, you know, self-generated or maybe they hired you to do it. But what are some other kind of tripwires that would rate, you know, cause them to say, I got to get some help on this topic? Again, that's a great question. There's a lot of things. I'm just going to speak from my experience, and this is off the top of my head, of the things that I saw probably just in the last 12 to 24 months prior to COVID. Uh, we were dealing with companies that had serious retention problems. So they were losing, you know, big, big manufacturing organizations that were uh, losing millions in retention. So they would hire, but they couldn't keep the people. Then those same people that they were losing were going on social media and, and, and marking negatively, do not work for this company. Uh, there just is one example. Uh, another example is a, uh, um, you know, difficulties between uh, employees, um, uh, middle management not getting along with, with those that they report to and, and those that they oversee not getting along uh, with the line workers. Um, you know, communication issues, a lot of things in a company may think they know what it is. That's what the assessment's for. 
Right. Uh, I mean, you can do a, you can do a, you can do a comprehensive organizational audit. Okay. That, you know, when you're bringing in, you know, scholars to write, you know, I mean, most audits or assessments we do don't go that far because it's costly. Yeah. So we do, we kind of do a stripped down assessment and, you know, that's through, you know, maybe several meetings and getting to hear what they think the issue is. And then we're using our experience, Nick, and, and saying, well, have you thought about this? Yeah. You know, and, and may, I may be, I may say, oh, man, I may realize that's the issue. You know, I may, but I don't come out and say, hey, that's the issue because now you're into emotional intelligence right. and I can't teach this stuff if I don't use it. Right. So you have to say, well, have you thought about this? And those are probably the five best words I've ever learned. And I was taught by, by a mentor of mine is because you're able to make a point without making them feel or putting somebody else down or, or talking down to them, you know, and I've always carried that around. So yeah. if there's a tidbit that somebody's listening to and they're like, Hey, you know, if you're taking notes, have you ever thought about is a great way to, to um, lay something in somebody else's lap that they need to consider. Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? You're wrong. Like, <laughs> right, 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 Nick. Remind me to take you on the next assessment. Yeah, I'm, I'm great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting problem that you solve. I mean, at the end of the day, whenever you have a bunch of human beings rubbing up against each other, bumping into each other, you're going to have conflict. When and kind of the continuum of conflict can range, obviously, on one end to like a fist fight. On the other end, it can be sort of a passive aggressive disagreement where there's this sort of like underlying tension. Um, when you come into an organization and let's just zoom in on kind of the micro type of engagement that you might be, or the micro type of conflict that you'll be working out, how much of it usually, and again, this is a broad brush, but how much of it usually is driven by, man, there's just like a low EQ on the manager side. I'm just trying, I'm kind of creating a, a hypothetical of a, a manager and a line worker can't, who can't, can't get along. How much of it is usually like just a, uh, like a power trip or just like a, a low EQ at the manager level, and how much of it is really um, the sort of baggage that some of us bring into our workplaces where we just have a bad view of management, or we've, you know, we've been burned by a boss before and we just think all bosses are this way. It's kind of a weird question, but like, do you see things kind of fall on one side or the other more, more readily? Like, is, does the rubber meet the road at the point where it's like, okay, I gotta teach this guy how to you know, have some EQ? Or is it more about, hey, we need to re reframe this and sort of hammer out some misunderstandings and stuff like that? Well, you're asking such good questions and, and, and they're so good. They're, I fear the program wouldn't be long enough for us to really, <laughs> you know, really uh, uh, attack that. I'm so, I'm trying to process that. I don't want to just, I don't want to just say, hey, it's 80% this yeah. and 20% that. But what you're saying are issues that I see, that we see uh, commonly. Yeah, low EQ on a manager's part uh, or difficulty in maybe uh, biases or even unconscious biases that, that people bring with them, as you mentioned, baggage to work. Uh, you don't know, when you hire somebody, I mean, what do you really know about that person? You know, when a company hires them, what do you really know? That's what I'm asking, you know? I mean, do you know how somebody was raised? Do you know the environment they were raised in? Do you know how they dealt with their parents? Did they even have parents? Were they abused? I mean, you know, in so many, you know, physically or emotionally, you don't know any of that when you hire. So that's coming to work and that may be playing a part. So how does, how do, you know, as good as we are, uh, Nick, and I include you in this too, because I, I know that you can read situations in, in people well. And some of us are a little bit more adept to that just because of our disposition than others. But even with that kind of prowess, how do you come in, 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 even if you do an assessment or if you're told by the organization, how do you come in and say, oh, this is what you need to do? Oh, it's, ju yeah. it's just this. It, if you're going to fix things at the level that you're talking about, that takes time to really see then you have to build trust and rapport and then you can begin to work on it. And then you can begin to see after some time whether or not that's making a difference. Okay. So that's, that's a loaded, that's right. loaded. So I'm going to say, I'm going to play on the safe side and I'm going to say it's about 50, 50. 
right. it's about 50%, you know, hey, the manager is, needs to work on, on the EQ here. And it's about 50% baggage. But guess what? That manager with low EQ may be coming with baggage too. And they may, and they may not have been taught the skills to know, you know, they were really good at what they did, right? Then they got promoted to, to supervisor or manager. And maybe that's not what they do really good. Right. And so, and so now you're affecting these people and these people may quit, right? Or this person may quit. And now you've lost a really good worker who wasn't that good of a manager because he wasn't taught. He didn't know. He didn't have the skills. So there's all of that combined in, in something like that. And that's all, I'm just telling you, that's when I go in. Those are the things floating around in my mind is to, is this what this may be a little bit of? And it's always a little bit of a few things, but that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. It's like a confluence of factors to your point, because we're all so complex and then all that complexity just gets sort of amplified when, or it gets compounded when it's a bunch of sort of complex individuals that are making up a company, you know? Um, right. And why do you think we, I mean, we all do this. We like that, that example you, you just gave, you've heard it a hundred times in the sales game, right? The great salesperson becomes sales manager and he stinks at being a sales manager or, you know, why do we as organizations or as management keep like, why does this keep happening? You understand what I'm saying? Like, why, why, why do we not, as we promote somebody to a su supervisory role, just, of course, they need some training. Why do we just assume that they're going to be good to go there? Do you think? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question with probably a million factors to it as well. Um, and I don't want to be the bad guy. I think a lot of times it's laziness on the part of the organization. You know, you just make assumptions. So you have laziness, you have uh, improper assumptions about what a person can and can't do or what they're good or not good at. You're also, you're, also may, you're also putting a person in a place that's really a future role based on what they do presently. Right. And that's a bad way. That's a, that's, a, that's a way to set yourself up and the company and the individual for trouble because right. you're putting them somewhere based on something that isn't relative to what they're going to do. Yeah, and you just kind of, to your point, either it's laziness or it's just assuming like, oh, well, if you're good at that, you're going to be good at this. How tough is it? And right. always that kind of, we always forget if you're in a position of management, you always forget what your own learning curve was like, or I do at least. I, I forget what my, what my own learning curve was like and how long it took me to go up that sure. shape and how deep it dipped and all that. And you just kind of expect people to just pick, pick up the ball and run. I want to go back to, I didn't mean to cut you off. Let me just go back to a previous point that I feel like I need to make. Because you asked about, you know, what are the triggers? Why does somebody call? Nobody, nobody calls and says, hey, Institute for Conflict Management, uh, we're having conflict and we want you to come in. And they never do that. At least in my experience, they never do that. If we're going into to an organization, there's usually some kind of relationship that's there, either on my end or Natalie's end, uh, or somebody's referred us, or maybe there's a conversation around, uh, hey, we're having some difficulty in this area, and then we, we know that that under the umbrella is conflict, but we don't necessarily call it that. But nobody, you know, when you're going for triggers, nobody ever says, hey, you know, come and talk to us about conflict. Uh, so it usually comes about through something, those triggers are something else. And generally they don't even know what they are when they're approaching us about it or going through somebody to us about it. They're just saying, Hey, can you, do you know somebody that can look into this? That's what we get a yeah, lot. It's, it's like the engine's knocking, but I don't, you know, they don't, they don't know how to look under the hood. They just, there's something going on in this area and I need some sure. insights or expertise. And that's a great analogy. That's exactly what it is. You know, you're driving a car and that's your business or your company or your organization or whatever it is. And it doesn't matter if you have three employees or 3000 in your around in your global, if you're driving that car and you start to hear noises or you see smoke, you know, there's something wrong, but you don't know exactly what's causing it. So right. you start reaching out, right. To, you know, you start looking to pull off the road and get some assistance, but you don't necessarily know exactly how to do that. And that's the, that's the position we are always coming from. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like an, I don't want to say investigator, but it's more like, I don't know, you, you have to kind of diagnose this thing. So you have to kind of get mm -hmm. in and start feeling around and, you know, you probably very quickly have to like see the lay of the land, get the kind of vibe of the organization and start to kind of feel like who are some kind of hot zones of people or, personalities, you know, I mean, it's, it's probably, a, it's probably each engagement is super different because each company is different. 
I want to, you know, your analogy of the car was so good. Um, you know, think about a business that's been running for a while and let's say it's been growing. Mm -hmm. So with growth is going to come, you know, going to come some obstacles, some things, you know, the more people you bring into the fold, the more, uh, you know, the, the, the more chance there is for culture to be affected either adversely or, you know, right. So, so you've been driving this car for a while, for a while, the organization, you've been running the business for a while. And like you said, we're driving on the road and it smokes or something's clanking and you, you know, you need to get that fixed. So you get that fixed. But if you've been driving something for a while, what are the chances that, you know, not too long after that, something else is going to clank and something else is going to smoke. And generally they come back and they say, Hey, I thought we fixed that. You know, what's the, how come we have this issue? We, we spent the money and we fixed the car. Well, yeah, you fixed the car in that moment for that specific issue. But when you've been doing something for a while and you've been driving for a while, you're going to eventually, you're either going to have to buy a new car or you're going to have to go through the whole car and replace the key components, right? Key right. parts. And, and I think that's where a lot of business decision makers, um, you know, where they, where they struggle because they just see the product they make. They just see the thing that they do in the, in, in the car having an issue or the organization having an issue is a nuisance. What do we got to do to fix it? How much is it going to cost? That's the kind of the attitude I see. And that's for a learning and development or professional development uh, professional. Uh, that's, I mean, we have to overcome that obstacle in every, just about every scenario. Yeah, it's so bizarre. Actually. It's a mindset, that mindset. And they, you know, it sounds like they, they seem to take this sort of like, project-based view to this thing like oh i just have to get this thing fixed or oh i just have to get knee surgery well no you need you need knee surgery because you're overweight and so what you actually need is a healthy lifestyle which means every day you're exercising every day you have a good diet right like that's going to keep that car running sort of smooth over the long run um and so what do you think it is do you think it's something like hey we you know when it's small it's easy i mean you know that sort of network theory you know as you add more nodes to a system, you know, the number of connection points sort of ex expand exponentially. Is it kind of like, well, if it's five or 10 or 20 or 50 of us, it's, it's small and it's easy. And as we get bigger, it just gets increasingly hard and it becomes a problem before we know what to do with it. Or do you find, or, or do you find there are some organizations that really sort of from day one, they're building in some of this stuff, some of these guardrails as, as I'll call it to, for the conflict resolution, give people a voice and so forth. Are those things, are you seeing those things being built into some organizations early so what, so they don't need a full, you know, a full overhaul? Mm -hmm. yeah, how does that work? And, and, I, and, and I don't think, I don't think what you're saying is cliche either. And I, what I thought about, as you said that, to, to illustrate, to answer the question, if I understood it correctly, what, what would it be for a family, Nick? It, would it be easier to raise a family with you and your wife with two children, or would it be easier to raise a family with 20 children right. or a hundred children? Okay. So I think that analogy in of itself explains, yeah, it's not cliche to say the smaller an organization is. It doesn't mean that a smaller organization isn't going to have issues and isn't going to have big issues and might not even have a, a bigger issue than some bigger. I'm not saying that it's an exact science. What I'm saying is, is the smaller, uh, companies or businesses or organizations uh, generally are not going to have some of the key issues that larger ones have um, just because it would be simpler to manage two children than it would 20 with 20 you're going to have 20 different you're going to have 18 additional dispositions right those 18 additional dispositions are going to affect the two dispositions that you originally right you know thought you were going to stop at right so you grow well that's great our family's grown who's not happy to have a family grow is there happiness that comes from that yeah there's there's all kinds of intrinsic happiness but there's also difficulties that come from that growth and i think that's the same thing that a company experiences as it grows yeah, I think that's a phenomenal analogy, actually, because uh, along with all this other sort of joy potential comes all this other kind of complexity from some of the stuff you're talking about. And again, if you're not paying any mind to the potential problems that could come from this added complexity, from this growth, from these different personalities, from the baggage that folks are bringing into it, the odds of realizing that sort of joy potential that can come from this magic group of people working together toward this mission uh, gets greatly reduced. So as you think about like conflict resolution, and this is kind of theoretical and just because I'm kind of interested in 
how our economy has changed over the last hundred plus years and how the structures that sort of are imposed on our organizations have changed and how attitudes of management workers and so forth have changed. How have you seen sort of broadly conflict resolution as a topic or as a, a tool uh, used within the organizational setting change over, you know, from the middle of last cent century to now or sort of the end of last century to now? Great question. I, again, just, just, this is just my perspective. I mean, if you ask, you know this, if you ask 10 of the people, you might get 10 different responses. So this is just, I try, you know, I'm yeah. not the guru. Uh, another thing my mentor taught me was it's better to be the, uh, it's better to be the guide on the side than the sage on the stage. Oh, I like and that. that always, that always resonated with me because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are quick to say, oh, Brett, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> you know, and, and then, uh, you know, and I take that hard. So I try to, you know, avoid that. Anyway, I, I Again, this is my two cents. Uh, I don't see much conflict resolution skill or ability in that, in, you know, in the, in, in the older days. I see a structure of authority. It was more, author to me, business and organizational from what I can read and what I see was much more authoritarian. Um, you know, this is what we do and I'm the boss and you're going to do it. You do what I tell you to do. You know, I, I, see, I see that kind of mindset or mentality. Uh, it's in the you know second half, or, or as you mentioned, uh, it, it, up until where we are now, where tools became necessary and skill sets became necessary to to uh, you know to navigate through difficulty. I'll, can I give you? Let me give you a, a, an illustration. I was doing a, a sexual harassment prevention compliance program for an aerospace company down in uh, in Orange County in California. And uh, I walked into the room and, you know, they're really nice people. There's probably 40, I'm going to guess 40 people in there. Mm -hmm. and, and when I, and, you know, I like to walk into the room and I kind of size up, you know, not that I know exactly who everybody is and whatnot, but I'm a pretty good, I look at people, how they're sitting and, you know, their, 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 you know, their facial gestures and how they're moving. Are they talking? Are they not talking? You know, what time of the morning is it, right? Because this was early in the morning. Anyway, so I just kind of look in and I'm putting my papers around and just kind of getting ready to, to go. And I see all the way, there was about four rows, um, about 10 in each row, about. All the way in the back row, very last corner seat is this older gentleman. And he looked like he was already 10 or 15 years past retirement, okay? That's, I mean, that's how he, he looked on the older side. So um, he was sitting there like this, literally like this when I walked in and, you know, and occasionally throughout the course of a two hour program, I would kind of glance his way. And I don't think over the course of about an hour and 45 minutes, he ever changed from this. So anyway, I just kept doing my thing, whatever, in right about five, six minutes before I'm about ready to end. I must have said something that kind of triggered it was near the end, right? He raises his hand and I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, you know, in my in my mind, I'm like, oh man, I don't know what's gonna you know. Right. I mean you got a split second to say, all right, here we go. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, yeah. So, I, so I called on the gentleman and, and he just goes, he goes, you know what, I've got something to say. Um, you know, I've been working at this company for 45 years and, and, uh, you know, and I'm about ready to retire, but I'm going to tell you, he goes, I'm glad cause I'm sick and tired of you guys. And he points at me, I'm sick and tired of you guys coming in, making these rules every two years. It's this and that, what more we can and can't do. And he goes, I'm tired of it. You're right. And he gives me this thing and he just leaves it like that, you know, and everybody in the room's like, you know oh, wow, did Henry or whatever Bill just really say that? And, right. and so, so, you know, my initial reaction is, oh, uh, you know, how do I body slam this guy? Because <laughs> I'm like, you know, why are you, why are you, put, you know, he's pointing at me. So I said, look, you know, and then, then the whole professional thing kicks in, right, Nick? Exactly. So I said, I said, first of all, I appreciate, I appreciate you volunteering how you feel, right. okay? And I don't want to minimize that. I said, and in the, in, in the easy answer to what you just threw out is there is no easy answer. Now, having said that, here's my, and I told him this, just like I told you, this is my two cents, my, my opinion. I said, you said you've worked here for 45 years. I mean, 45 years, maybe it was even closer to 50. I can't even remember. I said, that's a, you know, that's a long time. If we came in here 50 years ago to this room and we took a picture 
of this room, I'm going to guess if there were 40 people in here, there was about 36 or so men and they would all be white. Maybe there was three or four women and most of them would probably be secretaries. I said, that's a guess. I said, here we are 45, 50 years later. And I said, let's take a snapshot of this, of this room. We had maybe 50% male, 50% female. We had Asians, we had Latins, we had African Americans, we had whites. I said, that's the difference, sir. As I said, the reason why we come in here or why we're mandated to come in here for programs like this every two years is because the complexity of the world and of the workplace has changed and the diversity in the world and the workplace has changed. And I said, that's the best and simplest answer I can give you to tie in with, with what you were talking about there. It's, it's why is this? It's because the, the complexity of problems, you know, what's the difference? Why, why do, was there tools not then, but you know, wh why do we have these tools now? Right. It's because it's because the complexity and the diversity of the world has changed and we had to do something as little as it is to meet that. Does that make sense? Using that example to, to share, you know, how I dealt with that in that particular instance yeah. is my answer to your question. Yeah, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great kind of picture of this kind of changing of the guard. I, so did that answer, he said he's going to stick around for a couple, couple more years? I, I think, oh, here's what, ha it'd be interesting you bring that up. After he asked that and I said my answer, he was still like this. <laughs> so, right. anyway whatever i finished the program right and people are kind of walking around i didn't i kind of see out of the corner of my eye he's kind of lingering in the back but he was talking to somebody mm -hmm. and then you know i kind of lose sight of him and i'm doing whatever and i, I turn around because i'm standing at the front of this 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 meeting room i turn around and he's standing right there and he simply just he just held out he didn't even say anything he just held out his hand and he shook my hand interesting and he said thank you for coming and he walked out and the manager, the HR manager, who is, you know, really responsible for the setup and everything came over to me, you know, five minutes later and says, I saw so-and-so. She goes, he has never done that. Wow. He's never done that with any of the ones that we had before. And I think this was our second session with this particular company, yeah. you know, in so four years, it was our second time there. So that made me, so he didn't even say anything. But just the gesture of him coming up means I must have reached him on that little level. In that, in that moment, Nick, yeah, it did make me feel, it did make me feel better because I made maybe I made something a little bit clearer for for this gentleman as he's ready to exit the company. If he exits and he has a better, clearer picture of why we went through this and now he can kind of deal with his feelings on it, I think that's a lot better than him leaving you know, frustrated that, oh, things change so much over 50 years, right? Yeah, and so. I think that's a really cool story. It paints a nice picture. I mean, look, that was like conflict resolution in action, right? Like this guy's clearly disengaged, clearly yeah. didn't, clearly you're wasn't right. up what you were putting down, but you were able to kind of pause, breathe through whatever emotion that his uh, yeah. and Ray's yeah. did and, you know, evoked in you and really kind of meet him where he's at. And there was a lot of persuasion in that because he did look around and he said, wow, yeah, you know what, that is true. That is, that did change. And I don't know, he didn't have to say a word. The guy comes up and shakes your hand. To me, that speaks kind of volumes of opening his eyes. But it did something else also uh, that kind of struck me as you were telling it, is it exhibited the entire room. You weren't just talking to that guy, you were talking to the 39 other people in the room, uh, why this stuff matters. And there was probably some other people in there who maybe hadn't been there for 40 years and maybe hadn't, you know, gone through what other people in the room have, but they heard that response and they really probably could have been feeling the same way he did. So I think it's a really uh, amazing picture. And I think, you know, a lot, well, I'm gonna sort of say this statement and then it's gonna maybe be a question, but a lot of the kind of fodder for conflict in our organizations seems to be like a lack of empathy. And that lack of empathy is really an inability to remember, you know, maybe it's sympathy or empathy, I don't, I don't know, but. Like when you're coming up, you feel a, cer a certain way, right? Like when you're, the, when you're the bottom rung and you're trying to work really hard to move up to next to the bottom rung and all that crap is rolling downhill and you're frustrated because you didn't get your raise or you, you, know, you know, the boss just can't see you, see the value in you and all those kinds, kinds of things. What I've seen is I've seen a lot of people as they ascend up to that boss position, they forget what those feelings are like. And so 
it then just sort of drops a wall and then there can't be any connection through there and there can't be any of that sort of you know emotional empathy uh communicated and it just feeds into the these divisions you know these divisions within our organization that can get filled up with you know conflict yeah you're you you're you're really astute I, when i listen to you i feel like i'm listening to my brain oh cool. um <laughs> but you but, but you say it much better oh. um you know I, I i was thinking you know we get assimilated into the board that's what it is yeah. you get assimilated into the board do they mean to become the Borg? I, I don't think so. I try to, I, Nick, I think the better thing for us to do is learning and development professionals is to always give others the benefit of the doubt. And even if they are trying to do it on purpose, I think we give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that's our responsibility. If we have that intuition that we are talking about, we don't use it to magnify ourselves or to boast about ourselves. We use it to better people. So even if they, we do see them trying to wreck something, even though they may not even, you know, think that they're wrecking it, then we give them the benefit of the doubt. But I think that's what happens. It's, it's, it's why, you know, why do law students go into law school, Nick, and then they, in they're going to, I'm going to change, you know, I'm going to make an impact and I'm going to use, and then they come out and then five, five years later, six years later, some of them aren't even lawyers anymore, right? Uh, or, or whatever in the legal field. And then for those that are, you know, some of them, not all of them, but some of them have been assimilated into the dirtiness of the, of the work. Right. Right. And, and they've lo they lost that, that, oh, you know, that, that, that you, what you were talking, yeah, that, that, what you were yeah. talking about, that, 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 that the nobility. Yeah. Yeah. It, right. So, you know, when you're talking about people that are going up the rung, I, I see that in, in, you know, you mentioned key phrases and words like empathy. Empathy is a, a real skill. Boy, I'll tell you, I mean, I'm not just saying this. Empathy might be my number one. Between respect and empathy are probably the two biggest words I build out the professional development soft skill programs around. Okay. And I go in and I really make sure people understand the difference between sympathy and empathy. I said, people interchange those words, but I said, I they are. Distinct. I may have just done it. Yeah. yeah. They're distinctly different. And it's really good for us as individuals to understand the difference, not just for us, but once we really kind of understand in our mind, Hey, well, this is what this means. Then we, then we can start to, if you're still of that noble mind, you can start to move this out to the organization. How do we do this? I'll tell you what, if you give me 10 companies where everybody starts out noble, even the decision makers, mm -hmm. you know, maybe somebody will have it. This is in my experience. You're, you'd be doing good to find two of the organizations and it's probably more like one, and it could even be zero, that would start something and then, and then grow. And then the people that come up past that, you know, behind that, yeah, yeah. carry on the scene where that nobility isn't squashed, put away for, for, for the mechanism, right? right. So you, you probably would be doing good to find one, yep. maybe two would be exceptional. Okay, so you, you were saying, why, why, why? Well, yeah, that's a question I ask all the time. Why is that? Because to me, it seems a little bit, it seems more obvious. You take care of people, they'll take care of you. But something along the line, especially for the decision makers, gets lost. And then you get assimilated into, oh, well, I was noble, but I guess this is the real world, right? Yeah. And then you say, oh, this, so then you throw away all this stuff. You and you become, yeah, yeah, yeah because it's too hard. I understand it's hard, but there's a few organizations where you might, I'll tell you one that I'm impressed with. It's not a perfect organization. And I can get a, but if we had a message box, there'd be all kinds of prayer. You're so dumb. You know, this is the yeah. dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay. But you look at a, at an organization um, like a uh, Virgin with uh, Sir Richard Branson yeah. for the size of his conglomerate, for all the, I don't know if he's got 300 businesses or maybe it's a thousand now. I don't know. For the size of his operation, as one man, as really the leader of all of that, I, he's, he stands out to me as somebody who still tries to stay engaged. And because I read things that he does and I'm in contact with some people that work for Virgin um, in different areas, yeah. he does little things and they're little. Okay. And you have to on the size of that nature, but I'm like, 
you know, this is coming directly from him through his, through the people, but it's coming directly from, from Mr. Branson. And I just thought, you know, there's a man who it seems hasn't lost the nobility of why he started out with what, is he perfect? No. Is the organization perfect? No, but he hasn't lost the nobility. To me, I would feel pretty comfortable. I actually would feel, and maybe I'm, I would be different if I'm standing in front of him, but I'd feel pretty comfortable going in and making some sort of presentation to Mr. Branson because that's the, the, the feeling I get from him, the approachableness, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to somebody I don't know who would be far less more significant. It'd be difficult to go into some local business because they're just, they're assimilated into that Borg mentality. So I see what you're saying. There's no easy answer, but that's, that's how I look at it. And I ask that same question. Yeah, I think people get, I think to your point, people get chewed up and spit out by the machine or they, they see somebody ahead of them who seems successful on a single dimension, on the single dimension of their life that they see, never mind the family that's falling apart over here or they haven't talked to their parents mm -hmm. in years, right? Uh, and they say, oh, I need to act that way and I need to emulate this person. And so they begin to do that. And then there's no time for that stuff. It's just, it's, it's just a, very, it's a very bizarre thing uh, I mean, I get it's a human thing. It's, we all maybe have a natural tendency to do it, but if we lose our conscientiousness or our consciousness of this tendency to happen uh, and we don't kind of put firewalls up to prevent it, then we're, it's, it's almost like we're naturally going to calcify. You're naturally, your you're right. humanity is naturally going to get sucked out of you and you got to preserve it, right? And your organization, as it grows, it's going to get dehu dehumanized or whatever if you're not, to your point, doing that Sir Richard Branson angle of maintaining it in yourself and continuing to push that out in the organization. I would say two key factors of any decision maker, if you want to be, if you want to stay with the nobility road and as hard as that is, as hard as that is and as, as, as many difficulties as you will, will encounter trying to, to do that. But I would say uh, vulnerability. Yep on the part of decision makers or leadership, vulnerability and, and, uh, and empathy uh, are, are probably gold bars. And why, are, why is that even? Because vulnerability flies in the face of everything that we see around us in society. Right. Vul if you're vulnerable, if you're, if you're, and I'm, and I'm saying specifically decision makers, leaders, if you're vulnerable, then the chances are you're sincere, you're approachable, and you're still teachable. The problem I find with decision makers is that once they're decision makers, they shut off teachableness. Isn't that bizarre? Because the authority thing kicks in and they say, well, I have to present myself as someone who knows everything. That's right. So it's an, and, ego, it's an ego preservation right. facade that but, wraps around us that compromises the thing that people are going to connect with, which is our humanity. That's right. So it's disingenuous. It's disingenuous, insincere, unapproachable. But I mean, we talk about it and we see it, yet you look out into the, into the arena of the world and society, and we're not talking just business. It could be anything. It could be politics. It could be somebody's family, Right and how their family operates, you see this dynamic and you think, wow, that doesn't, why not just show some vulnerability, you know? Do, do you think a father who's stern and knows it all is, is, is going to endear himself to his children or is he, or is a father who knows a lot, but when he makes a mistake says, you know what guys, dad blew it, I blew it. And, and the, who do you think is going to be loved more? Exactly. Both ways, by the way. Who's, who's going to have a, a, a cleaner relationship? Absolutely. Um, and that's a great picture, again, for what we as leaders, whether we're running a whole company or whether we're running a division or you're just on a team for a task force, these are the things that we have to fight against. And we have to sort of lean out from, you know, trying to emulate this, you know, we have it all together. Who has it all together? Who doesn't have imposter syndrome? Who doesn't have, the, you know, a, a knot in their stomach before they're doing a presentation? You know, um, you never lose those things. And I think, you know, to your point, I mean, I happen to agree with you. Those would probably be my two as well. Um, you know, I would maybe say kind of authenticity because uh, I think vulnerability is kind of so related to it. You know, like if you're authentic about something, then you're going to talk about when you're nervous or you're, you're going to talk about, man, I don't know the answer here. What do you guys think? And that's going to allow other folks to 
and you know engage but i think a lot of the stuff we're, we're talking about man are um it's not all worked out and it's not all figured out because we're we're in the midst of this sort of like economy type transition do you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. we're, we're we're transitioning into this knowledge work or we've been here for a while there's still these structures like i'm like i'm always talking about that are overlaying us so the things that were needed in this sort of you know, uh, hierarchical structure that governed, you know, things during the Gilded Age, they don't translate well to now. So, but those structures are still in place. So people are still responding to the cues and so forth that were presented to them as they were sort of ascending through it. So it's just kind of like a messy time, you know, you know, I would guess in 20 years, maybe we'll be starting a new economy, but you know, by 20 years from now, so many of these conversations will have been had, it will be built into folks at a deeper level. And I think we're going to be able to realize that in this game, it's not just lip service that people are our greatest asset. They are our greatest asset. And to really unleash those assets, we need that, that humanity in there. And there, you're never going to have that humanity or those authentic connections if there's a facade of, uh, you know, ego preservation in the middle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let, let, you know, I, uh, when we talked before, um, you were telling me about some of like the research you've been doing about personality and personality type. And I'm just, I'm super fascinated with personality type. I had been, um, you know, I had been sort of in the camp that thought that personality type was kind of etched in stone. If you take a, a Myers-Briggs test when you're 15 or you're 12 and you take that when you're 85, those are going to kind of look the same. Um, but then when we were talking, you kind of presented a little bit of a different perspective. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of some of that research and some of your thoughts in that area. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of good psychologists that, that are out there. Uh, there's one in particular that, uh, that I've befriended and who's, who's a friend and who I just, you know, I, 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 I absorb his material the most and use a lot of his material in my, my instruction. And that's doc, his name is Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Um, and like you, Nick, I was of the mind uh, years ago, and it was, I think it was Myers-Briggs that I, I had, I had taken myself and I, you know, I take this thing and I'm like, okay, well, let me try this out. And it says, you're, you know, I answer these <laughs> questions and it comes out and says, you're an INFJ, right? And then you go over here and you read INFJ and you read whatever it is in general and you go, wow, that's what I am. And with the knowledge I have now, looking back at that, I thought that was so eye-opening then, right? I thought I was, I thought I was, I thought I had discovered something. And here come find out 15 years later, um, you know, I didn't discover anything. If anything, I put myself in a, in an unnecessary box and I, and I unnecessarily actually looked at myself without even knowing like I was a finished product. Because this says, this is what I am. This is my personality. I am this. Uh, you are an introvert. And, you know, so when you're reading something that says you are, you take that as... Those are declarations. Right? Yeah, it's declarations. It's concrete. That's what I am. Hey, in I took your this own test. Mind, I'm That's sorry. what I am. The voice mm -hmm. in your mind, like you're telling yourself, as you're reading it, it's your voice telling yourself that. That's right. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'm sure they meant good, Nick. Sure. But there's a lot of danger in that. And I didn't come. I'm so fortunate that I kept learning, right? And, and we'll keep learning. Uh, that my my learning, my desire to learn helped me to see how dangerous that was. And then I thought, gee, how many other people think like this or have done this or think that they're a finished product or what they are is their personality is what they are. So here's one of the let me share with you what was one of the biggest mind blowing pieces, uh, to me. Um, and I liked actually what it said in the INFJ. I mean, I liked what it said and I saw some, I saw some, you know, some, I saw things that were in me or what I thought were in me. But the, the thing that really shook me is when I read, uh, Dr. Hardy's book on, on uh, his original one was on uh, willpower, but he talked about these personality tests and, and he said, your personality, those personality tests say that your behaviors 
you have behaviors that come from your personality. Okay. And what he was saying is he completely debunked that and said, that is absolutely inaccurate and hundred percent, not the truth. Your personality, your, your behaviors, it's the opposite. Your behaviors determine your personality. It's for me, it was like, like what? Like what? So then you read on and he says, well, you know, look, are you the same person you were right now? Are you the same person you were a year ago? Are you, or do you think the same? Are you the same person you were five years ago? So then he takes you down this line of reasoning and, and he was like, and I'm thinking, of course not. I'm not, oh, I'm different in this way, in this way. He goes, so what he was building out was your personality is evolving and changing whether you're cognizant of it or not. So how much better to be cognizant and to give your personality changing some direction as opposed to just letting it. Yeah. Pulling the, uh, yeah, pulling the, uh, the oars out of the, out of the water and just letting the, the water take you kind of wherever, let the waves wash you wherever. I mean, it's crazy. That's, that's, and that's what will happen, whether you know it or not. So for me, it was, it was mind blowing for me to, to, to undo everything that I thought I knew prior to that, right. In regards to this, but then I had a real deep desire to say, how many of us live in these prisons where we think we're a finished product and all the decisions that we're making about our future are based on our past experiences? How many of us live like that? If I've been living like that and I think I'm kind of somewhat savvy, well, how many, you know, how many people look? So then I, I'm like, wow, I, we need to get this information out. That people need to understand that at least they have the opportunity to see this differently. You are not a finished. We are, we are, what did, there was one painter that said, um, you know, a painting is never finished. It just stops in an interesting place. I love that. Okay. So um, we are works. We are not finished products ever, Nick. We are works in progress. We can be more direct about that or we can just let it happen. But either way, it's going to happen. It's going to change. So the, and, then, and then the premise of the book goes all along or along his, his teachings go along uh, you know, hey, whatever trauma we've had in the past, whatever, whatever difficulties we've dealt with, no matter how large or small, or even if they're still dealing with them, you don't have to be defined by that. You can be defined by the future person you want to be. This isn't daydreaming, he said. This isn't faking it till you make it. This is conscientious, conscientious effort on our part to work towards a future self. And guess what? When you get there, in whatever form or fashion you get there, you're not done then. Exactly. You're just on to the next future self. And then he gives the illustration of Buzz Aldrin and how, uh, you know, you know here, here's this astronaut, does the pinnacle of achievement, gets to the moon, walks on, you know, gets to the moon, right? That's the pinnacle of achievement. Let's call that the pinnacle of an achievement because it's not the only achievement. The problem is, is that once that achievement was, was accomplished in, in Mr. Aldrin to put everything, all of his effort into that, his life after that slowly spiraled out of control and slowly went downhill pretty fast. And he had a number of issues and problems. And the example is good is because he never moved on. He never had anything beyond that. He right. thought he was done. He was finished. And because he thought himself done or finished or reached an achievement, he had nowhere to go but down. Right. He had nowhere to go but into, but into areas. And, and, and he suffered the consequences for that. Condoleezza Rice, the former national United States national security advisor, said, never be the former anything. Mm. And I thought, wow, man, how, why can't I come up with stuff like that? I mean, you know, I mean, that's like former, so profound. Who's, how many people are the former national security advisors of a, of a, you know, of a nation? You know, how many people are former astronauts? Yet look at how profound that is. Her life, she, and she's, you know, she's, the, she's the originator of that comment. So that tells me her life is not based on the fact, she may be you know, teaching in a college somewhere, or she may be, who knows what she's doing. And somebody may come in and say, well, that's on this level and national security advisors on this level. But she doesn't think like that. This is something that she was, 
right. and then she did. She learned, and this was something she was at that time. This is what she is now, whatever it is that she's doing and whatever it is she's focused on. And those decisions are not based on what she was. What she's doing now is not based on what she was doing then. Uh, I'll give you another example, and I don't mean to commandeer the program here. No, um, I was talking to ben, Dr. Hardy himself, and he gave me a really nice, uh, you know, he gave, he gave me a, a really nice illustration of 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 doing something not purposefully, but that got him a little bit of hot water uh, in copyright issue. Okay. And so the individual said, hey, you know, they contacted him or the people contacted him and said, hey, this was in this material was in this type of thing and this type of format. And, hey, what's going on there? Like, you know, and he goes, hey, look, at, you know, at the, at the time that I did that, I didn't realize what that meant. I didn't realize my didn't realize it was crossing, you know, might have been crossing boundaries here, there or that this would have this kind of in, implication. Um, he says, I apologized for that. He says, but the person I was three years ago when I made the decision to put that material in is not the person I am now. So I would never do that again. Right. So he goes, I didn't beat myself up and I didn't say, Oh, you terrible person internally. And how could you make that mistake? And in, in all, he says, look, I acknowledged it. I said, Oh, I see where the, I see where, where, where I made the mistake, but who I am now wouldn't do what I did three years ago when I did this. So, uh, you know, don't worry about it. It won't happen again. I thought, oh my goodness, how, yeah, how balanced, how yeah, balanced so and is so, that? Well, it's just, it's so freeing because it gives you like, I don't know, you know, I've just been kind of uh, thinking about what you said. You said, man, I thought I discovered something and I didn't, you know, how many of us, we think, wow, we got some finally, finally got some clarity, some insights about ourselves mm -hmm. when all you're doing is you're just like erecting these prison walls around you. Oh, and then you, so think, and then you think, well, this is, if this is who I am, I must act this way. And then if, if personality is really a function of the actions, and look, okay, I can kind of spin out on this here, but like <laughs> how much noise are in those tests, right? Yeah. Because those tests inherently assume that you know yourself 100%, right? So let's say your, your spouse who does know you 100%, well, they should be able to take that test as you, and that should be a pretty good picture of what yours are. I don't think that ever really happens, right? I mean, there's probably overlap and so forth. But my point is, in all those tests, they're never perfect. There's probably more than 16 personality types, if even that's uh, a reasonable metric. I don't even know anymore after talking to you. Um, but like, imagine taking it and then you read it and there's some noise in there because some of it is you uh, answering questions on ways that you wish you were. Some of it are ways that people have told you you were. Some of them are actually accurate. You get this thing back, this description of yourself and you're reading and you're like, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. Oh, okay, I guess I am that way. Okay, wow, I guess I am that way. And then now this is your, this is who you are. And then you just kind of live and filling in those lines. And as you're talking about the, uh, you know, the fact that this is maybe more malleable or our personalities are actually dynamic, it's kind of a, a revolutionary topic or a, re a revolutionary idea, at least for me, because it provides so much freedom to your point. Well then, okay, well, what do I want to, what do I want to be? I want to be more conscientious. Okay, well then now I have a mechanism to do that. I just have to act more conscientious and that's gonna turn into conscientiousness. Um, and as you were kind of talking about that, I, you, know, you never wanna be the former anything. A lot of us are walking around as the former version of ourselves still because we haven't changed in a long time. And if you think about like how a, a, uh, a spider or like a lobster, how they grow, they go through this molting process, right? So they have a shell or something around them that their body's essentially filling up and at some point, if they need to grow bigger, they have to kind of shed that shell and grow a new one. So like, I just kind of got this image, like if, if we turn into decision makers or we get to this age or we read this, this personality type and we think that this is who we are, we can kind of limit the possibility of us sort of molting. And like, if we haven't been, if you haven't molted in a while that, that you've been stagnated because you're not growing and you're not trying to change these things. And then it leads to this, this last point that you made, which was, it's hard to not beat yourself up if you think that you're a static person because that person three years ago is you. But if you're learning and you're changing and you're growing and you're expanding into different, um, you know, aspects of a personality and developing these, these new characteristics or, 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 or qualities, then it's easier to divorce ourselves from that old person, not to sort of divorce ourselves from accountability or responsibility, of course, but like to say, okay, well, I'm not just like awful person. 
I, I've grown past that. I have some clarity for it and I'm not sort of dragging this baggage along with me still, you know? To not only be able to think that, Nick, but also to be able to articulate it. Right. That's where that freedom comes from because you really believe that. Because the opposite of that and what, a lot, what I see a lot of us doing and what even you and I did was it was the same as pulling up four walls of bars, pushing them together, and then raising your hands in accomplishment saying, I'm free. That's, a, yeah. that's essentially what, that's the absurdity exactly. of, what, of what that is. So this is busting down those, those walls and then saying, no, 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 no. What do I want to be? And then consciously making this. Okay, so if I take Myers-Briggs and it tells me I'm an INFJ, the I is for introverts. So now I go around everywhere into a company, uh, in my relationships with the opposite sex, uh, you know, if I'm looking for, okay, my thoughts are always, well, I'm an introvert. So an introvert wouldn't do that or an introvert. Would, so then you carry this garbage with you because you were told after 70 questions that this is what you, that's not, maybe you are introverted. Okay. But maybe you want to be extroverted. So to go to your point, you say, well, what would an extrovert do? An extrovert would do this or do that. And that's kind of, you know, I want to be able to get up in front of people and make a presentation at work. I've been given the opportunity twice and I've turned it down because I've told myself I can't do it. Right. You know what? But deep down inside, I want to do it. So and frankly, those you know, same feelings that you're having that are preventing you from doing it, the extrovert may be having, but they read that same thing and said, I'm an extrovert. So I must not, you know, they discount could it. Be. Right? Could be, could be. Could so be burrow deeper into these holes, these That's pit right. that we place on which is crazy. So you can change, uh, you know, if you read something that says you're a night person, oh, I'm a night person, right? I'm a night person. Well, that doesn't mean that if you don't start in 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 apply your mind to saying, okay, I'm going to set that alarm at 5:30, and I'm going to get up, and as hard as that is, I'm going to set the alarm over on the other side, so I've got to actually get out of my bed and go over there and turn off the. Okay, you do stuff, and you take the action. Okay, you can change. You are not a night person. You can become a morning person through repetition. And that, in a sense, you're changing your personality because your personality has to do with the behaviors that you're exhibiting. Your personality isn't who you are. Your behaviors yeah, are. Who you are is what you do. <laughs> who you are is what you do, what you take in, right? That's, and so if you want to be a certain type of person, it's not daydreaming to think of that person and to start talking to others as if you are that person. That's not being fake. And that's no. the other thing that I want to get out there. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm ready to go to blows sometimes with people that want to say, oh, that's fake or that's not real. No, no, you're, no, no, you're the one that's fake. Right. You're the one that's stuck. Don't put people down. People need to be able to dream, Nick. They need to be able to dream. They need to be able to say, okay, that's a goal and I'm going to work towards that. It may not come out exactly as it is, but you're working conscientiously towards something. You are taking responsibility for your personality now. Yeah. The, same you're people, taking the same people will, uh, who say that, oh, you're trying to act fake, will see somebody uh, overweight at, at the gym and say, great job. Are, is that person faking it? No, they're not. Yeah, they're no, they're trying to yeah. better themselves or they're trying to hit some kind of personal goal that they have. That's right. Or right. Whatever. And, yeah. you know, it's very bizarre because there's so much division in our, in, in, in our country and there's so many of, of these issues that like we're all working, working through. And a lot of those are about issues of labels, right? We're putting a label on somebody and we're assuming somebody's putting a label on us and so forth, but we put these same labels on ourselves. Oh, I am a night person. I am a day person. I am a extrovert, right? All those things, to your point, if we don't have the sort of uh, dynamic mentality and being and able to hold those both at the same time, those absolutely turn into labels that we're placing on ourselves that we are subconsciously going to live up to or live, you know, within. Your decisions will come from that. Your subconscious is what drives your decisions. So, you know, if you tell yourself that, then your decisions, you know, if you're living in the past, then your decisions will never allow you to escape the past you, or not escape, but reframe. Okay. That's the better word. And this goes back to what I said earlier and I couldn't build, didn't have the time to build it out, but you can re, you know, people, Oh, I was abused as a child. And I mean, as terrible as that is, you know, either verbally or, or sexually or, or, or phys, you know, in whatever way you can overcome, you do not have to be defined by that. You right. are not that person. Okay. You, so you can, 
by, by, by understanding that your behaviors dictate who your personality is, you can reframe things in your past, even traumatic things, and make them a building block, not something that holds you back, but something that you actually use to, to, to propel yourself, to, to build upon, because right. you are not defined by that. It is something that you've been able to frame and put in its proper place. And very few people can do that because I don't think, not because they can't do it, it's because they don't know they can do it and right. they haven't been shown how they can do it. Yeah, they don't think it works that way. Well, I mean, and that's not the general sort of consensus, right? I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation if what we're talking about was the general consensus. You know what I'm saying? Well, look at the stigma for mental, you know, for, right. you know, they always say that there's for depression and things like there's a stigma. Well, that's where that comes from. Exactly. People are, are making decisions based off of the word stigma is saying that's what you are. So I'm going to hide this so nobody knows this is what I am. Well, you know, uh, People can be depressed. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have depression. Depression is more of a clinical uh, uh, designation. You can be depressed from time to time. Either way, whether you're depressed or even if you have depression, the, it's treatable. Right. So you don't have to stay where you're at. It's treatable and you can work with it and through it and you can frame it and, and actually use it for the good. I just don't think enough people are told. I think people are labeled yeah. and judged and put in a box and that box is ticked and they move on. And I just, I'll tell you, I have a real, that's a real pet peeve for me. I, we are going to keep going in the wrong direction until we start looking. This is why I told you for me, it doesn't even matter if somebody's doing something on purpose that isn't right. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because that's my opportunity to be noble. Right. Yeah. And not model, to judge. Model what we model, want. Model what we got to do. In the world, right? How can, we, how can we teach it if we don't? <laughs> do you know anybody that teaches stuff and doesn't do what I do? And that's I lousy. My kids, yeah. I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, uh, but yeah, I mean, being able to model that, I mean, it's not that hard to assume positive intent with somebody else. It's not, you know, and then again, you want to build in a little bit of wisdom. Like if you don't know for sure, how are you going to start shooting before you aim, right? You got to have a conversation and assuming that positive intent and teaching that and creating the opportunity to perhaps uh, coach or help somebody improve or whatever can do a couple of things. It can help that person sort of on the ground level, but also model this behavior we're talking about. And I, you know, as we translate this conversation to like the organizational conversation, it's just a very freeing thing. So an organization is not necessarily this one thing. Um, you know, if a company has had some bad, I don't know, uh, ethical issues, those all, all those things can change as well. Again, it takes that intentionality. It takes effort to make those changes, but like nothing's etched in stone. And I think, I don't know, this has been, you know, just kind of talking, I've thought so much about our first conversation and this conversation will have me thinking for at least the whole weekend, just like what an opportunity it is we are these dynamic things. We're these anti-fragile machines that are very rare and we can adapt to different climates and circumstances and all these different things. And yet we end up sort of uh, declawing ourselves in a way because we take away some of that, that, that dynamism that's already built in us. And when we can tap it, we can really ascend. We can really, we can really kind of change into that. Like the path of self-actualization should never stop, right? People just sort of stop climbing them that mountain. It's never a mountain that we're going to get to the top of, but you That's see right. people just kind of say, eh, I'm good here. That's right. That's so well said. That's so well said. We have a 30 day program in regards to that. Basically, it's change yourself in 30 days. So we give you an outline. We, we walk you with our hand, literally, virtually, mm -hmm. in 30 days. If you want, if this resonates with you as a person or as an organization, you can change pretty quickly. Yeah. You can change pretty quickly and pretty significantly. So think of how you feel right now, Nick. I know how I feel. So if we took this conversation and we had this conversation with five or 10 or 20 or 50 other people in an organizational setting, well, how are they going to feel? Well, maybe not every single 50 of them is going to be like, oh, this is my, you know, whatever. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. But if five, 10, 15, 20 of those 40 people or 50 people, uh, you know, are like, whoa, I've been living in a prison and I didn't even know it. Right. I mean, 
So what I'm saying is what, what we feel between you and I here is all that I hope to do for organizations uh, anywhere, uh, whatever genre, yeah. just be willing to listen and be open to that information and then process it. And that's, that's the difficulty in our arena is getting, getting the opportunity to do that. Because Nick, it's not like, oh, this one needs it, but this one doesn't. Everyone needs it. Yeah. Everyone needs it. So it's like, how do we do that? So that's my dilemma. I have no answer for that, but that's why I'm talking to you. And hopefully somebody hears this and, and they change and they look into something, or maybe we'll get something that comes from this and we'll, we'll be able to reach 50 or 75. It's just continuing to right. get that information out. Uh, we need to free people from, from self imposed imprisonment. And then you can watch people fly from there. And the best thing that, you know, we can do is take that information and put it in, you know, so people that come that want to know, uh, you know, like I said, we can put them in a 30 day program or put an organization in a, you know, spend a, an hour a day or two hours a day, if you want at max for 30 days. And you see how you've changed cognitive, you know, uh, with, with, with effort, concerted effort in 30 days, you will be, it'll, It'll blow your mind. And if you think 2020 has been bad, you've got three months left to do something for 30 days and see how you can turn 2020 around. And that is guaranteed. Yeah. And I will guarantee that. Yeah. I mean, we can change quick because those neural pathways can be reestablished and diverted and we can establish new ones. Like we can, yeah. to your point, I mean, if you think you can and you think you can't, you're right. If you think you're, if you think you're static, you're right. If you think you can change, you're absolutely right. You just have to lean into it and, put some intentionality and effort behind it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you, you know, it's our decision, Nick. It's yeah. ours. It's everyone who listens to this. It's everyone we may talk to about it. it. It's, it just, you need some intention to make a decision, but if you can do at least that, then you will, then it will self propel itself from there. You yeah. just need to be aware that you can, that this is there and then intentionally say, okay, I'm going to look into this. If you can do at least that to whoever's listening or whoever we talk to, then you can make the changes that we're talking about and make them quick. I love it.